tonight's uh, discussion here at uh, Health by Choice Education Research will be involving holistic dentistry and Dr. Danola is here from Cumberland, Maryland and he has a uh, extensive amount of training and uh, experience in this area and he has uh, quite a few interesting ideas to talk about and uh, as a, just a brief bio for him, he's um, practices in Maryland, uh, came from the University of Maryland uh, School of Dentistry and uh, has been uh, practicing now what, for the last 15 years or so? 25 years. 25 years. I'm 52. Okay. <laughs> so. 93, I graduated in 93. 93. So not quite a youngster, but somewhere in the middle. Uh, so uh, at this point in time, I want you guys take a listen to Dr. Danola and um, we'll have uh, probably some questions later on at the end of the uh, discussion. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you for inviting me. Um, I am going to do a little testimonial I'll tell you guys how I became interested in biological dentistry. <clears throat> I wanted to be a dentist since I was eight years old. and. Um, Along the way, I started watching MASH, and I thought, I'm going to be a physician like this guy here. And then I lived in a town in Leonia in New Jersey where Alan Alda was from, and I, I really admired him. But I didn't want my patients to die. I, I didn't think I could handle that. So my parents are artists, and my mom's mother's an artist, and artist art, artistry in our family. And so I thought, if I work with my hands, dentistry. So I kind of am doing my dream, you know, what I, when I was eight years old. Not a lot of people uh, do that. Anyway, so I go through dental school and, you know, I really believed in the institutions. And then in about 2000, so I graduated in 1993. In 2009, someone came in with some information about holistic dentistry, but it was from the DAMS newsletter, which is Dental Amalgam Syndrome uh, Non-For-Profit out of Minneapolis <clears throat> and I start reading and I'm like open-minded and the first thing I do is call like Blanche Gruby and some people that are in this letter and I'm angry that uh, my school didn't tell me these things so but what I do now is uh, so then there's this big journey and I go to every holistic conference and buy an iPad and start reading everything I can now I am today, what I feel like I'm doing is disseminating information and learning and then just saying this is information I'm learning. I've come to the conclusion that we had information, let's say Weston Price, he had information but he didn't have a lot of the things that we have today. So technology brings new information, research brings new information. There's, there's a myriad of papers explaining things biochemically I don't know if we use the outcomes. We don't use the conclusions a lot of times. So we have a ton of information about things, and I don't know if we necessarily use everything we learn, NIH learns, and put it all together. So my, the thing I do is, is really research papers, learn it to the point where maybe I can articulate it on a simple level, hopefully. And, um, but I'm, by, I finally, after I got over anger part, <laughs> I feel really blessed that I'm doing what I'm doing helping people, people telling me I'm saving their lives, which I never would have thought. People are coming from distances, all the biological dentists this happens to, people drive miles and miles to fly in to see us. So anyway, I have a joke that I never actually put in a slide before. So it's kind of a joke that it's in a slide form. So, so people say, what is, uh, you know, what is it? A biological dentist. So you know, we put our hands in the patient's mouth, then we ask them a question, right? So we, we do that. That's what we all do that. And then I'll and then I'll say, um, what's the difference between a biological dentist and a regular dentist? Okay. And I don't know if you guys have any idea what that is, but so this is kind of what I do. Um, I'll ask the patient, like still with my hands in their mouth, but then I'll answer it, and I'll say, Are you regular? Like I ask them if they go to the bathroom. Okay, and that's supposed to be funny. And then I say, do you poop every day? Like regular dentists won't ask that, right? And there's the poop emoji. Shame. Shame. <laughs> so the reason is, I wanna know if the pathways are open. You know, 
thyroid disorders and people don't have constipation issues they're not they're not getting rid of their waste that's kind of a key thing if you're taking out amalgams and if you're doing things to help them get better so it's kind of a funny joke but anyway a little bit <clears throat> so biological dentistry the number one thing I'll talk about first it's not just because it's an a but amalgam okay it's a uh, it's a major problem, and the problem is people don't know they have a problem. People don't know there is a problem. And uh, this is all backed up by tons of research, okay? Um, there's a 24-7 release of mercury. And depending on if you're eating or grinding your teeth, if you're eating things that are hot, you're gonna get more of that. We think there's chronic exposure that's going on, and then there's a whole body issue there. The, our bodies are amazing. What they do is they Toxins are either walled off or, or dumped into places where they're stored so to protect us. So we find these things all over the body. There are studies that show this. Um, animal studies with sheep and monkeys with radioactive uh, mercury. They've been done years and years ago, 30 years ago. But now they've done sheep studies with pregnant sheep. And there are many studies on this. Where, where does it go? Ultimately, it goes to the fetus in mothers and stuff, so. Um, I will talk briefly about safe protocols uh, and I'll show a, a couple examples of what we do. This is sort of a regular run of the mill mercury. I mean, if you have a gray filling, you have mercury filling. If you have a gray, if you have a gray tooth, a whole tooth, that's probably a metal crown, that's nickel, another issue. But this is like a typical, uh, this is a couple years later but someone will come in, and this is a woman, and uh, we take these pictures on a regular basis to just, just for treatment planning purposes, but it's also nice to show before and after, and then for uh, you know, patients to see what we're doing. Here's another case. Actually, I just finished this guy up today. This is a lot of mercury. This is a lot, okay? I mean, just to, just to reiterate, there's no medical device that has mercury, am I right, anymore? Even mercury switches on, on in the house, or they're not mercury switches anymore. And um, so the composition of mercury, if you look at cornflakes, the box cornflakes, the number one ingredient is cornmeal. So they call them cornflakes. They should be calling these mercury fillings. They call them silver fillings. Uh, so um, the FDA, ADA, and the World Health Organization all say there's mercury vapor coming off of these things. And, um, and um, this is a large amount. This is only the lower arch, so these are quite big. And then I actually just finished him up today, and I had a good picture. So these are large composites. These have to be crowns later, but we to get the mercury out in one visit or two visits, we like to do it that way. This is um, activated charcoal on his tongue, and um, we use a protocol where we pay attention to the vapor and the particles protecting the patient, environment, ourselves. Um, that's a sort of a separate lecture on its own, but for all intents and purposes, there's a protocol that if you have anything like this, you have to have it removed that way or you could get sick. So I tell, I teach people how to do this. I want, we, we in fact, at the IOMT, the Oral um, International Academy of Oral Medicine Toxicology, we are teaching, we're trying to teach like non-biological dentists how to do it correctly because they're hurting themselves and, and their patients. So that might be controversial just saying that, but it's the truth and I'm just telling the truth. So um, the other thing we deal with is, is a lot of periodontal disease, which uh, there's a complete link and cardiologists here could attest to the fact that biofilm is making up most, most diseases in the body are a biofilm. So, a biofilm is this a nice illustration of a biofilm. It's a colony of bacteria, multiple types of bacteria that sort of live together and they, and they create a little barrier, a glycoprotein, they protect themselves. Antibiotics are difficult to get in there and so they, they interact and actually swap DNA and all kinds of things and that's what makes a periodontal lesion. So you can have a tooth with a periodontal pocket and you get, we call it, I call it leaky gums but you basically having bacteria go into the bloodstream. So right from the mouth into the bloodstream. This is a really bad case. It's not a patient of mine, but I got it from the internet. But these are the connections we know today. Diabetes, 
is one, first one. These are the connections we can see today. Diabetes is a huge link between how much periodontal uh, damage there is, bacterial type, um, and actually controlling blood glucose. So if your glucose is high, you're actually feeding the bugs, the bugs are having a party in the gums because the fluid around a tooth will increase in sugar. So you're kind of creating a culture for the bacteria. We know heart disease, there's a many, many links. I have a, my last slide really shows some of the chemistry of this particular thing, of the, all these uh, relationships. We know women with uh, periodontal disease will have low birth weight babies. There's a myriad of respiratory problems with periodontal disease. Um, you, you basically can inhale the bacteria in your mouth, okay? Upper airway disease and um, COPD. I think even asthma could be added to that because I think that's probably a, a factor there too. Now, this is a scary thing to say cancers. Now we can even say probably prostate cancer because of the inflammation, creating a cascade of events and causing the, the the inflammation in the whole body. So uh, we know it, wherever there is an immune response, there's inflammation. Wherever there's inflammation, there's free radicals, if you know what free radicals are. Um, um, digestive problems just from swallowing. And arthritis is totally linked to periodontal disease. And xerostomia is just dry mouth, but you know it's a chicken and the egg thing, but you can have problems with medications that cause dry mouth and that cause periodontal problems. So. The other things we think about, and we've talked about nutrition a lot, and I could lecture on that, but um, in order to detoxify our bodies, we need the right minerals, the right nutrition, magnesium. There, there are many I can name. Um, uh, we like to talk about Weston Price's principles, which I'll talk about, but bone broth and getting the gut healthy and sealed and opening up pathways re requires the right vitamins and nutrients. Detoxification in the liver has a whole host of, of nutrients that become depleted with certain medications, uh, zinc, magnesium, right? So we have to pay attention to that. And we, we look at the whole body and um, nutrition is part of what we try to guide people through. I can't do all this myself, so I look for practitioners that are gonna help me with that. I mean, I can't do it all. So we do some biocompatibility testing of materials, and what we've learned from that is that the sensitivity issues that people have, they can't tolerate certain materials. So we use the ones that are least reactive, and those are the ones we keep in stock. But there are blood tests that you can do that are, that are helping with, with compatibility issues with uh, materials. Another sort of thing that we studied in the 50s in dentistry is the currents that could be created in, a, in, a, in the mouth with dissimilar metals. People know maybe from a boat, so you have a, cop, you have a copper prop and they put a zinc, piece of zinc on the bottom of the boat because it's sitting in, this, in a battery, basically. So two dissimilar metals in an aqueous solution is a battery. So in, in a silver filling or mercury filling, you have mercury, copper, tin, silver, and then in nickel, and then you can have gold. So that's like seven or eight in, in your mouth. So there is a current going on, and um, it's called oral galvanism, and it's definitely there. We see things corroding in the mouth. Um, so that's something a lot of people don't think about, but there's a, that there's a battery close to your brain is, a, is kind of an interesting thing. It's about 100 times like the voltage of your brain or 1,000 times the voltage of your brain. So it, it's another issue. Um, and we talk about fluoride. I mean, fluoride's just not supposed to be in our body either, even though it's like the seventh mineral in the crust of the earth. It's not, I think topically it may work, and we know that it makes the tooth harder there's some things like that, but putting maybe putting in our water, I don't know if that's necessary. I, I, the people that I study with, I mean, there are people that just want to get it out of every water supply in the world, in the country, and um, we, um, you don't have to have fluoride treatment in my office. I mean, that's, that's like a no-brainer. 
We also look at sleep apnea because now sleep medicine is very big and we can help with people who have sleep apnea by helping open the airway. Now you can do that through orthodontics or you could go from uh, the standpoint of appliances where you're advancing the jaw forward and taking the tongue off the posterior pa uh, of, the, of the, the throat. So the problem with sleep apnea, not that you can't, you know, you might not sleep with your spouse, that's one problem with snoring, but the other, the other problem is you get hypertension, and you start having some problems with uh, your blood pressure. What we think is when there's a deficit of oxygen, you know, just the theory, deficit of oxygen, maybe cortisol levels are higher, blood pressure goes up, and so uh, then you start having other issues like you start gaining weight and those types of things when you have sleep apnea. So th this is a very controversial subject I'm going to talk about now, but my feeling is the way I've constructed this concept in my head is if there is a piece of anatomy in the body, a tooth, that has a certain anatomy, cells, pulp, and it's a beautiful living thing, it has a function and a physiology associated with it. So a tooth is a fountain, okay? A tooth has blood pressure, has a capillary bed, and it pushes fluid out. That's a live tooth, that's what it's supposed to do. There are live cells inside it that are nourished by the pulp, by the blood supply, and they have tubules sticking out and they're all covering the whole tooth. There's thousands and thousands of tubules that go out to the periodontium or out to the edge of the tooth. You take the blood supply out, the tooth's not alive anymore. It doesn't have that pressure, it's not a fountain anymore, it's a sponge. And so Weston Price, we'll get into his work, Weston Price determined there's something toxic about a tooth that had a root canal, okay? So uh, like I discussed at the beginning, <clears throat> what's driven my, my mindset, my, my mindset is the technology and some of these things that we have today. He didn't have DNA, we have DNA. We know there are a hundred different bacteria that could be around a tooth. And we know the correlations between heart disease and some of these. Okay, so we know when you do an arthroma, or, arth arthro or yeah, there are bacteria from the mouth in those. Okay, 70% of the time, I, I read one paper. So there is, there is definitely a, a movement of these things. Not only that, there are toxins that these bacteria manufacture. They're lipopolysaccharides, they are toxins. So depending on what type of bacteria, what type of toxin, and then when you chew or masticate or chew, that gets pushed into the bloodstream. So you're um, having to deal with that. Now what happens immunologically is complicated, but for all intents and purposes, it's an acute infection that becomes a chronic infection, and there's a battle of your immune system. And there's a fire, I say fire and ice, there's a fire of inflammation, and then we're trying to cool it down with the other part of the immune system, which is a very intel intelligent design, but it goes back and forth, and it, it is a chronic inflammation um, that ultimately results in other messengers going out in the body, and then you have chronic inflammation in the body from that. I mean, I'm keeping it as simple as I can. When we have infections in the mouth, you have lit up nodes, lymph nodes that can drain or, or the chain, I have actually another slide for that. So there's chains of lymphatics, and this is what we're seeing in thermography, where there's, there's heat in, in, in coming from somewhere. And we know that inflammation, there's an uptick in temperature, so it, it, it only might be a, a degree and a half, but it can be detected. And, um, so this is all about pathways, like I was saying at the beginning of the, the exit out of our body. This is an exit out and it's an immune system. So it's, it's trying to get rid of things that are, that are festering and we call them focal infections. So a focal infection in, the, in a tooth, in a jawbone, they're gonna drain and they're gonna try to be cleared out. Um, so this is kind of the controversy is, is this really true? I mean, I just look at the, I look at the anatomy and the function. That's what I was trying to say at the beginning. Like, is the, is the anatomy still intact? So 
I didn't do the stats in the United States, but in England, there are, there are somewhere around um, 2,000 amputations of toes and feet in diabetics every week. Okay, so once you lose a blood supply in a toe or a foot or even a, a limb, you, you, it's not going to live anymore. And that's kind of what we're talking about. So, I don't know, it's not that controversial if you really just look at it. It's controversial if you say uh, you're pushing against something that's always existed. And I, you know, I, um, <clears throat> I don't know. It's just, it, to me, it just makes sense that um, non living things in our body need to come out. I mean, I had my appendix out <laughs> when I was in high school that didn't have a blood supply anymore. Some of the places that are stagnant, and you know, it's amazing you could be walking around with 70% or 97% uh, of your heart blocked, but you can for some reason. I don't know if that's circulation around the, the, the heart or not, but it's amazing that that happens. But when you lose all of it, all that blood supply, there's a problem, right? Yeah. Things die fast. So every cell in the body has a capillary. I mean, it's, it's crazy. but. So the places that are a problem, like the common bile duct and just different places in the body where they don't have a good blood supply, your sinuses are a big problem. Um, that's why typically you're going to be on an antibiotic for set, you know, 21 days because you just can't get, get, get it cleared up. So the technology is another thing that is pushing um, the way I think about things. And it's also giving us evidence uh, of things happening that we couldn't see before. Okay, so the, um, well, our, here's a, a technology that has been used for 50 or more years all around the world, but it's not very common in the United States, but it's ozone. Ozone predates the FDA. So, I mean, I don't know if it's grandfathered in, but I would say it's oxygen. It has no um, breakdown products. It has water and oxygen and hydrogen peroxide are like the breakdown products of it. So oxygen is, uh, ozone is O3. It's oxygen, uh, three oxygens with the same amount of electrons, not to get too complicated, as O2. So there, it's trying to find an electron. So it, it, it's very reactive and it'll spit off and it'll go to acidic areas where there's hydrogens or where there's acidic areas. So that's how we use it. It kills bacteria, fungus, viruses, and we use it any place where we need to clean up something. So on the surface of a tooth, in a, in a bony area, people that do root canals, we, you can fumigate the inside of a tooth with it. So there's a lot of, um, there are 10,000 municipalities that use it to clean water in the United States. So it's, it's used, uh, well, you know the spas have ozone now too, right? The other thing I use is uh, PRGF, which is made from a patient's blood. And we do a blood draw before surgery, and we centrifuge the blood, and we produce a fibrin clot that has growth factors. It's absent of white cells, red cells, has growth factors, and we think stem cells. So it's pretty awesome. But it's like, it's cheating a little bit. What it's doing is it's bringing a wound healing a little bit forward in time, and it works about three times faster. So we get quick. Um, the reason we use this, and, and we could talk about this, but when bone has to heal, you need rapid revascularization of that bone to get it to grow. So what we're doing is we're setting the scene, and we talk about nutrition. We're setting the scene with at least the clot, and we hope we have all the nutrition to build bone. But very rapidly what happens is you get blood vessel formation happening very quickly. And then bone cells are following that. And so you get bone growing in. So I could take a tooth out in eight weeks, I could put an implant in. So it's pretty cool that way. Um, another technology we use is, is a 3D imaging. Now the reason this is pushing the envelope on stuff is we can see things that we couldn't see before. So a 2D x-rays are common films we always take, we, we have taken in the past. A 2D x-ray has to go through a large amount of bone, so when you're trying to detect any kind of abscess or, or, or problem with a tooth, it has to go through a tremendous amount of bone, especially in the mandible. 
And then, so can we always make sure, can we always see it? We're not really sure if we can see it. So with the 3D, now this is a, a patient, a friend of mine. If you can, uh, you can see, whoop, you can see, uh, you may not know what you're see looking at, but I'm gonna try to describe it. So this is the maxillary sinus. This is a, a, a shot from the side, which is a typical shot you might see. This is a very thick and fluid-filled wall in the sinuses. It shouldn't be there. It should only be like a millimeter or two. So over here, this is uh, an abscess. This is a root canal. This is an abscess. On a 2D x-ray, you might, you might get a hint of that. You might see a little smidge of something maybe happening there. Very often, these things are asymptomatic. They don't hurt the patient, so that's the trick. A lot of dental disease does not hurt. Cavities don't hurt, typically. Periodontal disease doesn't hurt until the end stages. Abscesses like this don't hurt. I mean, that's unfortunate, but I mean, I wouldn't want it the other way because I, I couldn't go home because there'd be a line down the street, okay? So here's a ceramic implant I did, but this is a, uh, this is the cortical bone. This is a, a root canal that's, we call this doming. And this is, the reason this is doing this is the body's trying to wall it off. Like I said before, the body wants to protect itself, so it's gonna wall it off and try to deal with it as best it can. There's no blood supply in there, so it's, it's the periphery is kind of trying to challenge that, that area. So I also have an instrument. Do you have any questions about the cone beam? That's really, at, there's gonna be a standard of care at some point where every dentist has it because we see things we couldn't see. Now, it doesn't really detect cavities, but it's really looking at bone health, and, and if there's abscesses, it's looking at sinuses, and we can look at TMJ, and we can look at airway, the airway. So we can take it back a little bit and look at the airway. But these are all things that we're using for diagnosing problems. Um, so would you do a root canal on that? That, that? It already has a root canal. I, uh, yeah, this already had a root canal. But that didn't hurt him. But he, he did complain of some sinus stuff. So ENTs that are good and they look at this, they, they might say it's associated with that. Now when they do a CT at a hospital, there's a lot more radiation involved with the CT. A, a dental CT is a cone beam. It, t it focuses the, the, the radiation. And it's, it's very little radiation compared to um, a, a CT that you might remember in the past here. So, um, but no, I think, now, people that do root canals, will, you, could, you could retreat this. I tell people they could retreat it or take it out. But I don't recommend root canals at this time, but that's my opinion, and I give people a choice, okay? Um, but this, this is, you have to imagine this trying to heal. If you can go ahead and clean that out, is it gonna heal? I, you know, um, I don't know. This is a technology that was used for spinal surgery. It's a piezo, it was invented in Europe, and there are little, little pieces, little tips that we put on here depending on what I'm doing. It uses, it's very gentle, so um, it uses vibration and water to, to take away bone, and so it, you, could, you could sort of dance on a nerve or blood vessel and it won't break it. I'm not that I would. <laughs> But when I'm getting down where the mandibular nerve is, or if I'm gonna put the sinus, I can, you can lift a sinus wall, and you can do things with a piezo that you can't really do with a burr or a blade or anything. So this technology is really great for trying to bring things, um, to get things healthy. We also, uh, when I'm dealing with focal infections and I'm cleaning the bone, I'll use, uh, the bone is like very, like, unorganized and, it, and these little fragments just come out easily and we can clean it and debride a wound with this safely. I never put a, a burr or, or any kind of curette in the lower jaw next to a, a nerve. I, I don't go in there with any kind of hand instrument or burr. So we use this because it can just sit on top of nerve or a blood vessel and it's not gonna break it. So not that I would get that close, but. You can clean out things very safely. Um, and today I'm doing, I'm doing ceramic implants. Uh, 
they're, the most common implant is a titanium implant. And a lot of the Europeans and there's a, in the holistic world, there's a movement towards ceramics because they don't have a charge. They're inert. Um, they're um, essentially a ceramic and they're not metal. Zirconia oxide is what they're made out of. And in the past, they used to be a little bit more weak, but now they've learned how to manufacture them very strong. They're stronger than titanium. Um, they're biocompatible. The tissues love them, and the bacteria don't really collect on them like they do with uh, titanium. There are pros and cons to both. Uh, I think they're working out a lot of the logistics on fixing, fixing people's teeth with ceramic implants. So this is one I did, I mentioned before. Um, the newest, there are four, there are five implants on the market in the United States, FDA approved, that are zirconia. So the big names have them, and uh, this is the newest one that I'm using now. Um, it's made by Zeromax, and Zeromax company also made it for another company, Nobel Biocare. So it, it's becoming something that's more and more common. And at every dental, every biological dental meeting, you see the guys that are selling these implants now. And um, I trained with Dr. Voltz in Switzerland, and he's developing his own implant. He's he developed the first ceramic implants. And he's an amazing surgeon who, who uses biology for healing. So they use the fibrin like we talked about. They use these, these things all the time. And <clears throat> when people go to Switzerland, they get all their metal out. They get all their root canals out. I mean, this is what they're doing over there. And they get the nu proper nutrition. And we look at the whole body. I mean, this is what they're doing. And I try to emulate that here as much as I can. In, um, with other practitioners helping me with a lot of the nutritional aspects of it. And, you know, and when people are super toxic, I don't want to take out their, their metal right away. I want to get them feeling better. Um, so people that you know, getting people on the right nutrition and making sure they go to the bathroom every day, that's a big thing, right? I think Western Price is like the rock star idol of biological dentistry that I think about a lot because he was a brave man but he also was intuitive and he was trying to figure out why his patients were sick that's the big thing he was he was I think in Cleveland he was in Ohio and he he saw his patients being ill from heart disease and diabetes and getting cavities and he's saying well, what's going on you know and so he was very inquisitive and um, he he studied uh, primitive people around the world some of you guys know what, what I'm talking about but he ultimately wrote a book. He traveled the world with his wife, which is really neat. And uh, he looked at nutrition and the degeneration of the physical body. So if you look at some of the people that he saw, there's a reason why they have these big, beautiful jaws with no cavities and great airways, I'm assuming. Uh, and uh, he wanted to figure that out. So he went all over the world, deep into Switzerland, South America, all over. You know, Western Price, right? So um, anyway, I just, I think he did some great work. He was actually the ADA president for, I think, many years. And he studied the root canal situation. So he's a founding father of this idea, OK? And what he found, if you compare the modern world to the traditional, so you can say ancestral diet. You can say biblical diet. You can say. What, what your ancestors grew up in different parts of the world. That's one reason to do like 23andMe and find out where you're from and what your genes are because maybe you need to think about what they ate there in that part of the world. So what the, he did see is um, no corn syrup. I mean, dentists are really into the talking about sugar because it's not just cavities. It's sugar causes a problem with mineral balance it causes problems with immunity. I mean, there's so many different things. It, it's not just bacteria eating sugar, making acid, causing a problem with the teeth. It's bigger than that, OK? So um, and this stuff is more addictive than cocaine, right? So um, white flour, I mean, flour might be OK if you take you know, the type of Ezekiel breads and things where they sprout and they crush. And they don't pulverize it and take all the minerals out. Okay, that might be okay. 
um, process. I, I, I wrote it this way because he talked about canned food, but a lot of people, like Amish and people, can their food. So I don't want people to misconstrue what that is. But basically, it's processed food that has, you know, thousands of milligram, you know, thousands of grams of salt, and their chemistry is not good. Okay, so. They also didn't pasteurize, they ate raw milk, they ate whole milk, not low fat. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit happier that you could find in the supermarket whole milk, you know, now, whole yogurt and stuff, but. Um, and this, this is like a, a major problem. Um, it might, hydrogenated trans fats might be a carcinogen. I think people are calling it a carcinogen now. So trans fats, the body doesn't know what the heck to do with it. Fats, cholesterol and fats get incorporated into all our cells. I don't even know if our cells know how to handle like trans fats. I really don't. I think it's probably causing arteriosclerosis, right? I mean, somewhat. It's more profound than that. I mean, it also affects you know, mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. So a, as a result of not knowing what the cell can't identify what this is or the body can't, free radical, it's a foreign body, it's a toxin, right? So um, I thought that was a cool slide. And then there are people doing these proteins and stuff. Some are good, some are, you know, you have to be careful. And of course, all, all the, uh, I mean, I know they've done studies, and, and some of these vitamins, they don't even dissolve in our gut. I mean, they, they go out the other end, right? And, they, um, and toxics, you know, um, additives and colorings are, are pretty bad. So he basically figured out that once people stopped eating their ancestral diet, everything went wrong. So. Um, they, they lost the ability to fight disease and they became susceptible to degenerative diseases. I mean, it's, if, if you're not giving your body what it needs, it's gonna break down you know, at some point. So one of the things he said about decay, because he was a dentist, um, he, he, he started working with, and you guys probably know this, but he had a ratio of 50-50 cod liver oil to butter. And, and he would have people oil pull with that and then just swallow it. And they got the nutrition and they're giving, so vitamin K2, you guys might be familiar with that. He didn't know what it was at the time, but Weston Price uh, identified, he called it Activator X or Price's Factor or something he called it too. And uh, it turned out to be vitamin K2, which is probably in the last 20 years been studied pretty well. But teeth have cells called odontoblasts that actually pull in K2. It tells calcium where to go, so it activates osteocalcin and osteocalcin brings calcium into the blood and from the blood into the bones and teeth um, and you know this if you don't have enough k2 you're going to get they're going to deposit somewhere this calcium so one of my one of my people that i one of my people one of the doctors i really enjoy listening to is dr thomas levy he's a cardiologist we were talking about him he's a cardiologist attorney and he's written several books one of his books was death by calcium it really talks about vitamin K2, A, and other minerals you need to metabolize calcium, D3. And um, he wrote another book about um, the dentistry part, and he really connected the dots between cardiovascular disease and, and these infections. So I mean, I, I am talking from current physicians talking about Dr. Mercola talking about this, Dr. Weston Price, talked about it back then, but he didn't know all the things they know today. Uh, I think even um, Mark Hyman talks about it, too. So there are other physicians talking about this, this stuff. So. so why would the oil, why would you use the oil pool and then swallow it? Well, if you're doing oil pulling for detox, it's different than for helping cavities. I do the coconut, but I... Yeah, I spit it out, too. Yeah, there's two schools of, like there's Ayurvedic, body. there's Ayurvedic medicine and then what he's doing, what he was okay. doing. So Ayurvedic medicine is bringing oil in and moving it around for two to 10 minutes, it's a long time, and spitting it out. 
So I say waste paper basket or your neighbor's lawn, not down the sink because you don't want to get it down the sink. That's Ayurvedic and that's actually draws in a lot of the bacteria and maybe even like if you had mercury, it's gonna draw it in. But what he was trying to do was repair, but also give nutrients. So cod, fermented cod liver oil and butter is gonna have all your vitamins. So now you could oil pull and then spit that out and then you do it again and swallow it too. I mean, you could do it two times. But the idea was to get the nutrients in your body, okay? He wasn't so, viewing it as a detox. Yeah, I don't think he was looking at it the way we think about oil pulling today. But it all, all of the oil pulling concepts will change the biofilm or the bacteria. That's what he showed, actually. Some of his studies were like, what does the plaque look like and what's the plaque composition after you start doing the oil pulling? Or the coconut, or the butter and the um, cod liver oil. I mean, the, the kids were doing that. I think the butter makes the cod liver oil taste okay. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's not the tastiest thing in the world. You got maybe you pinch your nose and maybe you're when you were growing up or even your well, did. you did your cod liver oil, right? Cod liver oil. It wasn't fermented. It wasn't fermented. <laughs> so yeah, let's go back here. So I, I really like to emphasize the Weston Price stuff with my talks because he's he's like my he's like my rock star, you know, that I that I admire. So Nutrient density, you hear a lot now with paleo and ketogenic diets. What you're talking about is whole foods, you know, grass-fed foods, and when they say grown properly, that without pesticides, on organic soils, and then prepared, that's like sprouting or soaking seeds and nuts and things like that. And then when you do that, you're gonna get four times the calcium and minerals than regular food, which is cool. and you have 10 times the fat soluble vitamins. So these are the things that we look at. I mean, there's a reason why the people, the primitive people eating that diet were healthy and strong. This is what he concluded, okay? Everybody gets that, I guess. Free range, right? And then, of course, they ate, a lot of, and around the world, they ate head to tail. You ever hear that? I mean, my friend who's Bolivian, he eats the muscles in the face of the, of the cow. I mean, I, I never did that, but I mean, I have had, I've had some meats that are around the mouth. But, and then, you know, uh, making collagen with the hooves and stuff. And then organ meats, even, I'm Italian, but in Italy they eat organ meats more than here. I find like that a little difficult to do. I went to the Weston Price meeting and we had a chili that was organ meats and it was fantastic. You can't tell if you spice it up and you sneak it in i mean conceivably i you could do it for your kids and they wouldn't know it maybe make a chili she listening over there <laughs> and then you know eggs everyone knows what a what an egg looks like that's that's not a factory farm it's like golden that's where the k2 is the golden fat golden <clears throat> or the fat soluble and this is like my this is like my big slide. This is the finale. You know, the last slide was the, the small fireworks. This is the big one, okay? This is kind of putting it all together. This is the reason why our mouths are connected to our body, and we can show it with biochemistry, okay? I mean, we're learning, every, we're learning stuff new every day. And I, I read these complicated papers that we talk about. I can't tell you what I read because it's very complicated, but these are, these are some of the, so there's something called a cytokine, which just means cell movement, okay, in Latin. Cytokines are when you take Motrin or give your kids Motrin, their fever goes down, that's a cytokine being pushed down. These things that are happening in, in biofilms in gum disease will directly come out and form, this is the I, this is interleukin-6, this is a huge one, that actually if you, if you did an open heart surgery, interleukin-6 goes up just from the trauma. So it's, it's a very ubiquitous uh, agent in the body. But when it, when it gets high in chronic, in chronic inflammation, it goes to the liver, and the liver makes C-reactive protein. And C-reactive protein can be measured. Most people should be having that on their blood panels today. It's not that expensive to do that. But if you're, you should be under one. If you're at three, what's the risk of heart? Four times, five times? 
Less than one. And then if it's reached, let's say three is considered to be uh, too high, and that's moderate. It can go to 10, right? Right. And that's and then in regards to basically uh, inflammation of the blood vessels. It can go as high as two. I had a patient today that had 15.5. So when they're he that could have high, an M, He could have an MI in the next four months. He could have an MI in the next four months. You could say. Yeah, it's yeah. a sign that something is percolating. Yeah. And when they get to be 15, now I'm thinking even beyond the part of the vascular system. I'm thinking maybe there's a leukemia or perhaps there's a cancer. Right, I was reading that too. Yeah. Maybe from, let's say, uh, some type of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, things like that. Yeah, so C-reactive protein reminds me of like PSA or doing like a prostate screening or, you know, this is a screening for inflammation in the whole body. Then if I rule out there's nothing going on here, maybe we think about other things, right? Um, but you know, fibrinogen, and that's another cardiac thing, right? Cardiac. Uh, so we have we have all these things that go into the baby, the heart, the gut, and I read a paper where this was a uh, multiple patients with real bad periodontal disease. Okay, where their teeth are moving. They take all the teeth out while they check their C, C reactive protein. In six weeks, it went. It, it just dropped after they took the teeth out. I mean, it just went right down to normal. So they know, and they, obviously there was nothing, maybe other, other things going on, but it was all focal infection in the mouth. So th there are papers that show that pretty, it's pretty clear that there's a problem. Yeah. Anybody want to talk about this at all? No? But we, we know all that, we know this. Yeah, I think the big thing here is what we're coming down to as far as just broad strokes of information. Inflammation is just the, the true um, the, the key point. We talked about because all of our disease states. You know, we what's happened in the past is we've always looked upon things like getting a diagnosis from a biopsy specimen or something like that. So that's way down the the, the pipe, so to speak. And what we're trying to do see what things are actually a common denominator. And this shows it right here because all those things you just mentioned, those those are inflammatory markers, the IL-6, right. the fibrinogen, all of that is inflammatory yeah. markers. So it just shows you how, whether you're talking about the heart, the tooth, whatever, it's all the same basic information. There's a big set of um, inflammation occurring that's, that's creating the disease state. And then the tie-in, I think also, with the inflammation um, has to do with free radicals. And that's why the um, question I have for you when you get a chance is, is like, what do you do for a patient who, who whose tooth has gotten bad and now the, the doctor says, well, looks like we need a root canal. And uh, so how do, you, how do you describe that uh, dichotomy of, should we go straight to the root canal or should we consider all, all you know, alternative approaches and what are the consequences of Well, I'll go, I'm gonna talk about the common denominator. I like that and if you do the math, you know, remember like what a math common denominator is? So you put oxidative stress on the bottom, you could put cardiovascular disease, you know, prosthetic hypertrophy, you could put anything on top. And the reason it's so, I think inflammation is what you said, it sounded like you said information, but the information about inflammation is becoming clear that it is oxidative stress and it's our ability to deal with that oxidative stress in every disease, Alzheimer's, every disease. So our, our endogenous antioxidants, which is glutathione, is a huge one. So every cell has glutathione. And glutathione will, those re, they, if no one knows what, I mean, it's hard to describe free radicals, but basically they're very, they're, they're normal breakdown products from all metabolism, okay? And if they're in small amounts, the body can kind of deal with them with the several enzymes and take care of it, quash it. That's the fire I was saying, that's the fire. Put it out, but when you have something like mercury in your body, your glutathione gets depleted. Every disease has glutathione depletion too, Alzheimer's, right? Cardiac, I'm sure, glutathione's depleted. 
So if our endogenous antioxidant systems are, that's why we should have green tea, that's why we should have vitamin C, because those provide the source to put out the fires, okay? And as far as, <clears throat> as far as, you know, you're trapping me with a question here about, I don't recommend root canals because of the things I know, okay? I don't recommend them, I, and that's my opinion. Patients have a choice, that's all I say. Today, well, so if there's fundamental, like huge abscess, like I just showed you before, if there was a huge abscess, the chance of healing that is harder. Is, is, so the prognosis goes down. So when the prognosis goes down, if there's mobility, pus, exudate, that kind of thing, it's unlikely that it's gonna heal very well if we do a root canal. So, so and now with, with root canal, with the ceramic implants, we could take a tooth out when it's failing and put it in a ceramic implant. In fact, all the implant companies are going to these root canal specialists and saying, buy some implants because you could just do implants. And they're very good surgeons. Instead of doing the little cleaning out the inside of the tooth, they take the tooth out, put the implant in. And so that's happening more and more as a trend. So root canals, you could consider a, um, what would you say, a uh, term? Um, my, fr my friend and I were just talking about it. it it's kind of like, a great thing for acute pain, okay? That's the pain that we don't normally see in dentistry is a toothache. It gets people out of pain almost all the time. So you devitalize, take the tooth out, that's where the pain's coming from. So for, <clears throat> I think Dr. Levy says it has a uh, inherent, it's, in, it's, a, it's a flawed designed system to think we're gonna, it's gonna work. So I say, you know, from a year to a few years, maybe it, it's, a, it's a waiting period where we say, let's save the tooth, especially a front tooth. You don't want to take a front tooth out. Clean it out, you know, do ozone and put some medicine in, and then come up with another plan, possibly. Um, you know, if you're really honest about, like I described it before, if you're really honest about having a dead thing in your body, I don't know if that's a good idea. I mean, so there are some, there are a couple people in Europe doing studies where they clean out the tooth, they do ozone, they put calcium hydroxide, which changes the pH and kills the bacteria, and actually the, the abscesses will heal. I mean, he calls it the endless root canal, which sounds terrible, right? It sounds like, you know, Hades or something, right? But what, it, what you're doing is you're changing the environment, killing the bugs, and it's enough that it's, it's dealing, so. I just don't. I just don't recommend them, and I, but I, I give it. It's a personal choice for people. Um, you know, there are uh, reasons why, if someone has a really pro a problem with controlling their sugar and their uncontrolled diabetic, I wouldn't recommend a root canal because they're not going to handle it very well. In fact, there's a higher failure rate in diabetics in root canals. It's like twice as high. So. You know, that's the oxidative stress, that's the ability to fight infection that diabetics have problems with, blood flow, all that. Um, but, I mean, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, and, and, and if you're at cardiac risk, I mean, what, we know what happens with bugs in the mouth going to the heart. So, I mean, you don't want to put someone in a situation, or if they have any, any kind of cancers, I don't know if I'd recommend root canals. I mean, I, I don't think it's maybe the best way to go. I mean, you have to think common sense about the whole body as a, as a whole, like the body as a whole and what the patient has. Now, I'm not a physician, so I never say anything. I didn't really say this before. I don't really say anything about outcome when I do this removal of mercury. I don't say if you have some kind of problem like thyroid disorder, I don't say I'm gonna get your thyroid better. I never say that, ever. So I say I'm lightening the load of toxicity on your body and trying to, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing. I'm taking off some straw, however you want to think about the analogies. <clears throat> um, reducing toxins, you know, and I'm recommending, I mean, when you start to clean up the gut, if you look at Gerson therapy for cancer, they clean the gut up, get the liver healthy, they start moving all the toxins out of their body, you know, give the body a chance kind of thing. So I don't. I think when there's a compromised situation in a person, I, I, I think maybe the choice would be lean them towards not saving it. Mm -hmm. So that's me. That's what my on my Facebook looks like. That 
I have a, I'm going to redo my website, but this is MD because not medical doctor, but Mark Danola, uh, Dental Wellness Center. That's very good. <laughs> and uh, my logo is the yin yang. Somebody developed this for me. And this is kind of a funny, a nice font, which looks like a mouth opening like that. So he picked that font for that reason. And then there's some symmetry with the lettering, the numbers. Um, and I, and I, I was the first integrative dentist in, in Western Maryland. So kind of cool, sweet spot we're in between Pittsburgh and Baltimore. And anyway, thank you for, your, no one fell asleep completely. No. So that's good. So that's good. Yeah. So, um, well, thank you very much. Yeah, that's very good. Okay.